Shall we smell the remainder him? Nadia has told me that you have certain questions, so we will take questions after the end of this session, inshallah. But let me uh, go through the presentation that I have prepared. So this is the concluding session. Uh, we are going to talk about teaching in general and teaching this course in particular, how to do it, why to do it, and so on. So first of all, we start with the question of how to teach. Well, now what we are doing here is that uh, we are actually teaching you a new way of teaching, which is very different from what teaching you have already received and what you are used to doing. So it's uh, rather difficult to do this. Uh, we have to recognize that we are faced with a uh, difficult problem. The students are used to one pattern of teaching and they very strongly resist changes. So anything you change that, um, even any small changes like when I was at Islamic University I started using slides because it gives you a more organized uh, lecture. I mean, when, when I prepare slides, I have to discuss, okay, I have to think, okay, what are the points that I'm going to make? Whereas if you just stand up and start talking, then uh, you don't have to be organized. But even that was resisted. We are not used to slides. We want a uh, chalkboard. I mean, any, even a simple changes, the students are not and the real problem is that students don't want to think because actually it has been conditioned out of them. I mean, they tried to think at some point and the teachers beat them. But no, you're not allowed to think. You're just supposed to copy what I'm telling you. Uh, my own daughter was uh, in a school. She was asked a question and so she went and looked at books. So the teacher was very, very angry. He said, what, what did I give you the notes for? Because the teacher had, uh, does not have the knowledge of what is going, she only knows what's in the notes. So if the student comes in with some new ideas, the teacher is in trouble, <laughs> and uh, teacher doesn't want to be in uh, a position where she has to expose her uh, ignorance. So the students have been conditioned against participating or questioning or actively really being part of the class. So this is a habit that you have to break, and nobody likes to break habits. Also, it's uncomfortable for not just for the student, but also for the teacher. So the first thing to understand is the teaching is all about motivation. That's why you have to talk about purposes. If you don't motivate, basically, there is no way that you can teach all the things that the students need to learn. The only thing you can do is to create in the students an interest in learning. If you create that interest, then they will go out and learn. And if you fail to do so, then they will not learn even what you teach them except for the purpose of parroting it on exams and it will be of no use to them whatsoever. So uh, motivation is a matter of the heart. It is not a matter of the mind. This is very important. Yeah. So you, in order to create motivation, you have to reach the hearts. I have a lecture on how to inspire and motivate students which you might look at. But the first thing is that the material that you are teaching must be relevant, it must be useful knowledge. Uh, not only that, it must be relevant for our lives in a way that the students can see. It cannot be that this is the material that I need to answer the question. So if the, when the student asks, is this going to be on the exam, this just reflects that the only value that they see in the knowledge that they are learning is for able to pass the exams. It has no relation to their lives. It has no relation even to their jobs. And this is true. I mean, if you take the average person who has gotten job, except in teaching. Teaching, there you have this illusion because you learn the material and then you repeat it and you never see the real world, so you think that it is useful. But if you go out of the academia and you ask, a person got a PhD in economics, did he use that knowledge? Well, as I've said, the state bank, uh, they start training you from scratch in economics because nearly everything that you have been taught is wrong. So 
it must be relevant. If the students are inspired to learn, then they will put in the effort required. Now, this is certainly true that this course, one of the reasons that students don't like it, they will resist it and it will be hard to teach them, is because uh, they have to put in a lot of effort. So why should we put in effort? Why not just go in the past way? So in order to, uh, I mean, in order to motivate them, you have to discuss successful past experiences which, uh, with this course. And there are lots of them and we will get discuss some of them. So the first thing that you need to do is to make a lesson plan. Unfortunately, in this course, it has all been done for you in advance. You have the lectures and but so what you have to do is to watch and read the lecture and then think about what is it that you want to convey to the students from this. You have to really any plan this out that the student come in with, comes in with a certain state of knowledge. When he leaves the class, he should have more. Uh, there he should learn something during that class. Normally teachers do not think in this way. They say that I have to cover a certain amount of material. And they think, they think that their job is to cover the lesson and the student's job is to figure it out. There, it's not my job to teach the student. My job is to cover the material. If I cover the material, I have done. Now it is up to you. Ma alayna illa al balagh. So I have delivered the message and now it's up to you. You understand or don't understand. That's your business. Uh, as long as I cover. But no, that's not... We have to... Covering is, is, is a very common methodology of teaching. It's a terrible methodology. You don't want to cover things. You want to uncover things. You have to engage the minds of the students. You have to get them involved. And they are not going to easily be engaged. You have to create interest. Now, what will you do if you don't cover? This is the problem. Uh, because that's also required to some extent... So here we have backup. In my courses, I record the lectures. I prevent the students from taking notes. I say that, uh, you see, open your mind, try to understand what I am saying. Uh, don't take notes because that will interfere with the process of trying to understand. Whatever you can take of notes, a better thing is available in the recorded lecture. So you can listen to again if you don't didn't understand. You will not understand everything necessarily, but there is a backup. So you have already notes. So you don't have to... Uh, your own written notes, they, they will be just a mess of confusion. Because if you didn't understand what I am saying, then how can you take good notes? So focus on what I am saying. Uh, for, try to understand. Then I have to fulfill the accompanying responsibility. I cannot say that, okay, here is the line, first line of the proof, here is the second line of the proof. Don't understand, just memorize the sequence. Because then I am not asking them to understand. Uh, often it is the case that the teacher himself doesn't or herself doesn't understand. So they, 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 here is the proof. This is what it goes. Y equals X transpose X and X transpose Y. And we derive the formula in this way. Don't ask me what it means. This is what I was taught. And this is what you have to learn. So if we want our students to understand, first we must understand. Then we must convey this understanding. It's a risky business. At the end of the class, you should ask the students the questions to assess whether they have learnt or not. And here there are two types of problems. There is confirmation bias. You are looking for answers which will tell you. You ask very shallow questions because you, you want to uh, just confirm that people have learned. You don't want to find out that they didn't understand. It's a very bitter experience that you wasted one hour of breath and nobody understood anything. It has happened to me many times when I assessed. Uh, in fact, the first time I taught an undergraduate course, after about two weeks of lectures, I uh, started asking some questions and nobody had understood a single word I said. I started the course over from zero uh, after adjusting my um, expectations and materials. So, uh, then there is also fear of failure. I mean, you are, uh, you want to convey things, but you are uh, afraid of your own ability to do so. So, you do many tricks. I was once uh, observing a teacher and, uh, well, okay, it's a long example. 
so uh, we have to worry about our attitude towards the students the typical uh, students have an adversarial attitude that i am trying to get the points out of this teacher and they are guarding it jealously and they are going to give it with great difficulty if i only so there is a fight between the teachers that the student wants to get the points and the teacher wants to keep the points to himself so uh, this has to be replaced by a parental attitude that i am deeply concerned about my students i want to make sure that they learn they are like my children and i am very happy when they succeed and i am very uh, saddened when they fail then the students will immediately ask that okay so give me 100 points so i say my goal is not to uh, your success is not measured by your points success is measured by your acquisition of knowledge and so spare the rod and spoil the child i have to punish you when you don't learn so that you are incentivized to learn this is also a part of the uh, parenting you have to be also non judgmental this is also very difficult that okay if a student is failing that doesn't mean that you are a worthless person this course is not a judgment of your personality it may be that this material is not suited for you so uh not everybody can learn calculus it doesn't mean that they are rotten people so this is something that i mean as parents we love all our children regardless of uh, whether they can succeed in getting a phd or uh, whether they go into uh, brick laying profession they are all precious and valuable as human beings and having acquiring any type of knowledge is not a test of your uh, humanity so uh, we have to uh, yani this is a difficult balance delicate balance because you have to have concern compassion caring but you can't give in to them you can't uh, actually be personal friends with them this is uh, also outside of bounds you can be friendly but you cannot be friends um and you cannot and you have to discipline students but you cannot be an uh, extreme this cannot be the uh, the only thing that you do and this cannot be the primary mode of your interaction you have when you are disciplining you have to say that this is unfortunately i am forced to do this because of the if students are making noise then um, you have to take action but um, you have to do so in a compassionate way and you have to say that i am doing so because it is necessary for the benefit of other students if you want to talk please leave the classroom and go outside and talk but allow the other students to learn so all of these things are necessary all right so in this course we need to make radical changes in our uh, educational models the standard model which we have all used is the teacher is an expert a conveyor of knowledge i have i have the knowledge and the students are trying to get it so this is teacher based or teacher focused learning so this is uh, the wrong model instead what we need to do is have a student focused class we have to focus on what the students are learning so uh, what the knowledge i have is not relevant the what matters is are the students acquiring this knowledge now very often teachers are uh, especially those who are insecure and most of us are they are uh, the process of teaching class is a process of displaying their knowledge and expertise and wisdom and and uh, impressing the students and that doesn't help actually it hurts in some ways the student uh, the teachers student need to trust the teacher uh and in that sense they should know that the teacher knows the material but um if they are overly impressed then they will say that okay this is material that we cannot learn that's why you have to start from the student end that currently they don't know anything now you monitor what is the first step you see when you look at how babies walk it's uh, and how uh, see they take one step and they wobble and they fall down so the mother doesn't say that look at that idiot can't even take one step she says oh wow wow 
ایک قدم اٹھا لیا آدھا قدم اٹھا لیا کتنی بڑی بات ہے سو یو انکریج اسمال بگننگس اینڈ یو بلڈ آن دا اسٹرینتھس انسٹیڈ آف کریٹیسائزنگ ویکنیس دیر آر تھاؤزینڈ ویکنیس ان دا اسٹوڈنٹس اینڈ ون گڈ تھنگ سو یو پک اپ دیٹ ون گڈ تھنگ اینڈ یو پریز دیٹ اینڈ دا اسٹوڈنٹس آر ہنگری فار پریز سم تھنگ دیٹ آئی لرن ویری لیٹ ان لائف آئی یوز ٹو ڈو ویری آئی مسٹ ہیو کاسٹ اسٹوڈنٹس آر لاٹ آف ڈسٹریس بائی کریٹیسائزنگ دم ہارشلی um you can criticize but should be gentle and less and uh, encouragement and positive feedback is very uh, rewarding so uh the there is another way to arrange things which is the fellow learner model that we are all in this together and let us learn together so um especially for teaching this course uh most of it would be unfamiliar to most students because i have rearranged this material quite radically so you say that well let us be fellow learners in a journey this requires some self confidence on the part of the teacher because teachers do not want to expose their weaknesses to the students for the justified fear that students can pounce on them and they do when they uh, sense that the teacher is weak so we have confidence that yes i have seen this material i understand but maybe i don't understand all of it try maybe i can make mistakes and so as long as you are uh, open uh, this method can work now when we ask questions and quizzes and take exams this is not for the purpose of evaluation again this is something which is very difficult for students to understand and even for teachers that we are not judging the students that here is an a student and here is a b student what we are trying to do in the process of exam is to assess the learning process to get an idea how much students are learning so if the students cheat it is extremely counterproductive because uh suppose that all all of them get the right answer then uh, that means that they have all learned the material but in fact they have not so i am hindered in my ability to understand where the students are so that i can help them improve better learning outcomes we can use quizzes assignments exams as instruments which will create learning again this requires a different way of thinking about teaching one of the things that you have to understand that even though we will try to start the process we will create uh, germs we will create seeds of learning within the classroom to give them templates to work with real learning will always take place outside the classroom when the student tries to engage and understand the material solve problems it cannot be done inside the class so we have to motivate students to work and we have to train them out of very strong cheating habits that we just uh, copy the uh, paper of the other person there are many many techniques that can be used to prevent cheating uh first of all uh we have to do something which is called continuous learning every lecture should be followed by some discussion outside class some 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 method of processing the knowledge that you have acquired some attempt to absorb this can be done by creating groups and group leaders and asking them to go and take fellow students and discuss with them the material and if there are questions raise them post them send them by email create a discussion group we had several in, in my courses we have set up a blog and students can ask questions from each other or from the students um now the thing is that you should be trying to create skills in students uh, they should know how to do things not having mental knowledge or book knowledge so you have to understand what does this lecture translate to in terms of doable skills not in terms of doable skill is something that that uh, people acquire it's like building a table or 
driving a car. So we have the, this course is built around that. Uh, in the lecture, we go through concepts and we demonstrate them in Excel. And then there is a lab following the lecture in which the students are asked to do exactly the same things that were done in the lecture on their own data set with Excel so that they will understand. So this reinforces the lecture. It also gives them valuable skills. And as I said about successful experiences, there were, uh, even though when Uzma and Nadia taught it at uh, ARID, there was very strong resistance. I'll say something about that later. But at the end of the course, the students really learned a lot about Excel and they were very, very happy and they got positive feedback long time after the course that what we learned we were able to use in all our courses because people as teacher asked us, do you know Excel? And we were very proud to say that, yes, of course we know. So, uh, you can, one of the things is that here, uh, when we go, that here we are, we're trying to deliver some really first rate, world class, top of the line material, not available anywhere. So we expect the students to be grateful and happy and thankful. <laughs> no way. <laughs> students are going to be very unhappy, very strongly resistant. Uh, when Uzma and Nadia were teaching this course, they, they made a group and they went to the complaint to the HOD and to the vice chancellor. Very fortunately, the HOD was very strongly on board, said nothing doing. You have to just uh, uh, follow this course. They, uh, you cannot, uh, they said, give us the old teacher. We want to study the old material. But they didn't allow and uh, ultimately. So the Prophet ﷺ said that, you people are all rushing towards the hellfire and I grab you by the neck and pull you back. So this is the kind of thing that uh, takes place in these courses, that we are trying to do them a favor, but they don't want, <laughs> they don't want this favor. They want to just be left alone. So, uh, my concern right now is the teacher resistance. You will be uh, reluctant to use a new methodology for teaching which is unfamiliar. The subject matter is unfamiliar, the pedagogical style. If I teach this, what happens if the student knows more than me and they expose my ignorance? Um, lack of expertise is a major barrier that uh, I'm teaching this for the first time and uh, maybe I'll make mistakes and uh, the students will catch it. So that's where we, and if we start by a frank uh, and honest approach that we are uh, uh, fellow learners and I always try to follow this model. Uh, this is a lifelong switch that I am a learner and this really helps a lot. My, uh, my teacher Gilbert Strang in uh, for linear algebra at MIT demonstrated this approach. He put up a very simple matrix and then he said, hmm, I wonder what the inverse of this is. And um, I don't know exactly, but he started doing that. Hmm, what number should come here? So I was baffled, you know, this MIT professor is having trouble with some <laughs> very simple calculation. So then, of course, we all tried to help him. <laughs> so jumped in and said, so this is the thing that uh, of course, he knew the answer, but uh, I don't know the answer. You can say that I don't know the answer because my knowing the answer doesn't matter whether I know the answer. It's, it's whether you know the answer or not, which matters. Let's try to discover it together. That is uh, the fellow learner model. In that way, whether you know or whether you do not know, doesn't matter. So, uh, you have to... Uh, but there is a delicate balance. You can't really be a, I mean, you have to know. <laughs> so you will be, I mean, if you really don't know, then you'll be in trouble because then uh, five students will give five different answers and then they will look to you for the decision. And if you cannot decide, then uh, you will be in trouble. So you have to, yani, but basically, if you have one round of lecture in advance of them, you are one step ahead of them. That's all that's ne necessary. You can make mistakes, again, you know, allow yourself to make mistakes. You know, I'm human, I, yes, I made this mistake. I, I often make uh, mistakes in lectures. Not often, but enough. Uh, so, the um, test the students to assess progress comprehension, but do not evaluate or judge them on the basis of this.
this. You, when you ask a question, it's not because then the students don't answer. When you, when you when they think the teacher is uh, out to judge them and he is going to kill them if they don't understand, then they will not ask. They will not answer questions, even if they know they will be afraid to say anything. So if we are in a, we have to be in a nurturing. Uh, atmosphere and it's difficult for the teacher, difficult for me. If I say something which I've been explaining for half an hour and the student makes a, uh, uh, gives the wrong answer, I get angry that look, <laughs> I've wasted half an hour <laughs> and that's, uh, you don't even understand this, what have I, what you've been uh, doing the last hour, you've been doodling on the paper, this is, this is the normal. So you have to avoid this as I learned by experience. Uh, you have to suppress this anger and uh, say, I see, well, let's see, try somebody else. This is the best way. Uh, that way you don't have to engage with that student. <coughs> so the inverted classroom is the way I'm planning to teach this course next semester here at Pine, but I don't recommend it for others. Uh, inverted classroom is that I ask the students to watch the lectures and then when they come in, we will discuss the lecture. But for various reasons, this is difficult to do. Uh, it requires some teacher experience and, uh, and some student experience. So uh, we have to um, develop, any because the knowledge we have been taught has been dead knowledge, purposeless, meaningless. So we have not been uh, given the motivation to learn and so we ourselves, as teachers, we have to acquire the thirst for knowledge. So we have to remember that learning is from the cradle to the grave. We have to go and study real world applications, as I will discuss later. We have to try new teaching techniques, test them, assess them, see this one works, this one doesn't work. Uh, we have to read about uh, pedagogical techniques. There are thousands in the literature. We have, but first we have to take an interest. We have to try to be teaching our students. Some new techniques that I have used. You should give take home assignments, have the students work, and to prevent copying in statistics, it's very easy. We have the WDI data set, World Development Training. It's a massive data set. So every time I, I give a data set, I assign students to a different country that, okay, you do it for uh, UK, you do it for England, you, uh, you do it for uh, Tanzania, you do it for Bangladesh. The same, uh, everybody has a different data set and you can easily get that data set. So now, cheating becomes difficult, although not impossible, but basically there's enough. Then, also talk to the students, they look, um, I am very happy when you help other students to understand the material. I am very unhappy and you actually hurt the other student by allowing him to copy because that prevents them from understanding. So you should be my collaborators, you should be. I want students to work in groups, help each other understand the material, it's very useful. But I don't want them to copy from each other, to, to copy without understanding. So students do understand this, if it is repeated often enough. And uh, so uh, we do something which is called in-class cooperative grading because it's very difficult to, and if you assign, if you do a course like I'm suggesting, you have to give a lot of assignments, then grading is a big mess, very difficult. So what we do is, and it just takes lots of time, so we do is, okay, I distribute the assignment, yeah, giving every student somebody else's assignment, and say, let's grade it together. I will discuss the answer, you look at the answer you got, if it matches, you grade and we discuss with each other. The students ask, okay, hey, my, my question is this. So that brings up a problem that uh, we see that, okay, this student misunderstood the question in such and such a way, so you clarify. So that way, uh, grading is being done. Also, the uh, question is being uh, understood because we are working through it together and we, we are catching the mistakes and we are correcting them. So that way you can uh, small group problem solving. You set them problem and you put them in small groups and you say, okay, think about it and work it out and try to. Uh, and I ask them that at the end of the session, every one of the group must understand the solution. It's not that one person writes it down, the others copy it. It's that the whole group should understand. And then I ask 
individually, okay, any one of the persons could be asked that, okay, explain to me the solution. Student-centered learning is action-based. When students do something, then they will understand. And group-oriented because uh, actually social learning is very important. Students learn from each other more easily than they learn from the teacher. Uh, one of the ways, uh, one of the techniques is that when you have a midterm coming up, I give them 20, 30 questions and I say that a uh, large number of questions that, okay, if you solve these questions and understand them, you will be able to pass the midterm because it will be on the same pattern, not the same question, but the same pattern. So try to understand the answer. If you don't understand, ask me or ask somebody else. And any, it's not that you should have the solutions. We don't check the solutions that way because if you give a larger exam, you can't check solutions, but you can ask students to make sure that you understand these questions because so what's on the exam will be only a small subset of these questions, but you can give a big set and hope that the students will try to solve them on their own. If you don't go overboard, it works. But if you go overboard, I mean, I'm telling you my experience, if you give them 50 questions, they will just throw up their hand and say, we can't do it. So you have to give them something which is feasible, which they can do. And if they do it, they will be prepared for the quiz. And that's, uh, that's one way to get them to solve problems. All right, so some of the features of the course you, you need to know in order to be able to, I'm actually selling the course to you and you have to be able to sell the course to the students because why will they put in effort unless they know that there is something unique, something special, something different about this course. So one of the things that's very different is the hands-on approach. Students will actually learn how to do things which is very different from, uh, they, they will learn how to drive the car instead of getting a lecture on how to drive a car. And uh, I gave them the example that, the, uh, I gave you the example that I tested uh, six or seven students for lectureship and none of them knew how to calculate simple average because all they don't know is how to solve book pro problems written in books. They don't have an idea about how to apply this skill to real world. So I have tried in every lecture to take a real world data set and to try to arrive at some understanding of some real world issue based on the analysis so that you have this connection between theory and reality which is essential. Every lecture has a lab associated. The lecture itself is designed so that it is intuitive, it's comprehensible, it's conceptual. I don't focus on the Excel manipulations. This also I, I learned. So what I did was, and I do the Excel, I say, but Excel you will learn separately in the lab. Focus on what is being done rather than how it is being done currently. So you have uh, the big picture, you have the understanding. Later we will teach you how, you how it is done in your Excel lab. So both parts are necessary, the concept and the practice. Uh, neither part by itself is enough. So for example, you see if, you, uh, if I want to teach you how to add fractions, I can say, okay, you take two fractions, you multiply the denominators together, you cross multiply numerator denominator, put things on common platform and add the denominators. Okay, now you've learned how to add fractions. But nobody would understand what this means. So now if I say that, okay, I want to explain the concept, I say, okay, take a pizza pie and I want to add uh, one, one um, half to one third. Okay, so I can cut the pizza into half and I cut the pizza into thirds. That won't work very well because I won't be able to add the slices. So suppose I cut it into six slices, then three slices is half and two slices is one third. So it will be five slices. So now the concept is clear. The, you, what I'm trying to explain is these two things are completely separate. You can understand the concept of the pizza easily, but from that you cannot get the rule for multiple adding fractions. You can understand the rule for fractions, but from that you cannot get the concept. So both of these things have to be taught separately. So this is how the lectures are structured. The lecture focuses on the concept, the why, and the labs focus on the calculations, the how. And these two things are completely separate. And you have to teach both. Most courses teach only one, uh, the how. How do you calculate median? Why you calculate median? Nobody knows. Neither the teacher doesn't know, the student doesn't know, they don't care. And that's why it's meaningless uh, knowledge. 
And that's why it's only good for exams, not good for anything in the real world. So we demo the things in class and then we ask students to do it on their own. We can assign occasional group projects. Group projects is a, something which is very common and it's very difficult to do properly because what happens is that one person does it and everybody else puts their name on it. But um, it is possible with some difficulty to create projects where the students actually work together to solve things. Uh, but it's not easy. All right, so now some of the design elements, what went into creating this course, it, was, it has been created over the process of 10 years. Um, and many, many things have gone into the design of this course. So it's not, it's not just any course. And there is no comparable course. I have checked all the textbooks. There is nothing like this on the market anywhere, including Coursera, etc. There are many courses on statistics, oh, huge numbers, thousands, but, and textbooks by the hundreds, but nothing like this. So one of the things is that there was a revolution created by computers. It happened in my lifetime, uh, in the 80s, the University of Columbia where I was, uh, put a personal computer on my desk and I didn't know how to use it. Uh, and since then, there has been massive increase in computational abilities. Now, the discipline, statistics and probability, was invented in the early 20th century. Fisher was one of the creators, and Neyman, and Pearson, and other people. They, they created the modern statistical theory. At that time, uh, that was pre-computer era. Calculations were very difficult to do. Even the hand calculators were uh, just uh, being invented. So what they did, they substituted for computers by making assumptions. Let us assume that the data is normal. So it turns out that you, know, you can do huge numbers of calculations. It turns out that normality is a beautiful assumption because you can take a thousand numbers and reduce them to two numbers, the mean and the standard deviation. And that's all you need according to the theory. If you know the mean and the standard deviation, you have all the relevant information about the data. You don't need the rest of the data. So 1,000 numbers reduces to 2. Great. But there is a real world complication. <coughs> mean and SD are the best data summaries for normal distribution. You can prove it. <coughs> but you can also prove that they are the worst data summaries for nearly all non-normal distributions. So. Uh, there are alternatives exist, but these alternatives are difficult to compute, difficult to work with in the pre-computer. Now these are easy. But if you look at all the textbooks, except a few, you will find that the main focus of data summarization, mean and SD. Why? Because these are perfectly adapted to normal distributions. But uh, normal distributions are, are not common. This is another thing. That in reality, in the real world data sets, the normal uh, distribution is very rare. It's not very common at all. So the generally speaking, the best summary is the median and the interquartile range. These are good for a large class of distributions, including normal. Nothing is good for universal data sets. Not for, I mean, nothing works for every data set, but these work for the vast majority of things that we encounter. Now these, unlike the mean and unlike the standard deviation, which are very hard to explain, you just say, okay, here's the rule, calculate this, calculate that, and you, this is how you get it, or just feed it into the formula. What does it mean? Why should we do it? You can't explain it. You cannot explain this to a beginning student because the theory behind it is too difficult. So you just say, okay, memorize this and reproduce it on the exam. Now, the median and the interquartile range, they are very easy. Median, this is the point at which half the data is above, half is below. Everybody can understand it. Interquartile range is the middle half of the data. A quarter of it is above this box and a quarter is below. Again, it's very easy to understand and motivate. So this is your, this is why I'm saying that the teaching is intuitive, conceptual. You are trying to communicate something which the student should understand. Now. The truth is, as, uh, as, as I'm 
explaining by experience that students don't do this. I was teaching this in my first class in a statistical class at Islamic University and I explained the concept of median. I put in a, a set of seven numbers and I arranged them in order and then I picked out the middle and then I uh, asked a student, okay, uh, here's a new list, do it. He said, sorry. I said, no, you haven't been listening? He said, sir, you know, uh, I had uh, the textbook. I was using a textbook at that time. This textbook is written in uh, America. The students there are much better background. I come from a poor village. I don't have the background. I can't understand these things. This is beyond my capabilities. So he had already shut off the switch in his mind. He had already made the decision that I'm not going to understand anything. And the truth is that the vast majority of the students are like this. At the start of the le lecture, they shut off their minds that nothing that is going to be said by the teacher will be understood by us. So first, you have to wake them up. So, um, they will not believe you. They will not trust you that what you are saying, going to say is going to be understood because they have no experience of this. They have been taught a huge amount of garbage, things which cannot be understood, which just uh, can only be copied down and memorized and reproduced on exams. It is not meant to be understood. All of this utility function and maximization, Allah, bala, this is meaningless stuff, has no, no relation to their experience. You see, you are telling them, when you teach them utility theory, that you are a shopper, but you don't understand how you shop. So, I am a pathetic person. I don't even understand my own experience in shopping. So, this is because uh, the theory is very advanced, very fancy. So, basically at the, at the most fundamental level, the goal of our course is to demonstrate the failure of the idea of secular knowledge, that there are areas of knowledge which is outside the scope of religion. That is not true, but now the, you have to understand why it seems to be true. And uh, uh, there are actually two or three deceptions that are done in the course of Western education which allow this magic to be done. It's like the magic of the uh, magicians in, in the court of Firan. They made these ropes appear to be snakes and the people were afraid. And this is exactly how the Western magic works. Uh, what they do is they say that there is something called theory and there is something called applied. So, I am teaching you theory. Later on, you will learn how to apply it. But later on never comes. So now, when the student asks, what's the application? He says, oh, be patient. Learn the theory first. Then we will teach you how to apply it. And you never teach him how to apply and he never learns. So this is a, this is a fraud and a delusion. So, uh, once you say that, okay, the theory cannot be separated from the application. And that's why the purpose of why we are learning this is important. Once you say this, then whenever you go to a real world application, then Islam is immediately relevant because what you are doing is either good or bad and Islam will tell you whether it is good or bad. So then uh, you, can, um, you can study this book, How to Lie with Statistics and you can see that statistics can be used to deceive people. So the issue is whether or not we should be deceiving and how we can do statistics in a way that is truthful and honest and achieves good purposes as opposed to achieving bad purposes. So all of this will happen only if you go outside theory. While you are within the theory, you won't see any relevance of Islam. So as I said, you have to integrate theory and practice and this is not done. So that's one thing that because this is that because it was never done for us, nobody taught this to us, it is, doesn't exist in current textbooks. So you have to go and learn and uh, this is one of the things that I had to do in developing this course. I had to go and find out who uses medians, who uses means, where in the world, because I was never taught these things and these do not exist in textbooks. So uh, where are these things being used? Now David Friedman's book Statistics is based on similar, in fact David Friedman and I were email correspondents, we had very similar intellectual trajectories. We both started out as very high-powered 
theoreticians and we published in Annals of Statistics and pure theory which has not any relation to reality. But David Friedman uh, started doing some legal cases with data, with statistics and uh, then he found that real world things are different and then when he tried to apply his statistics he said oh all of the assumptions we are making don't apply to this data so we can't use this theory. So ultimately after a lot of experimentation and effort he came to the realization that all this theory is useless. So he wrote this book statistics it's full of real world examples and so that's one place where you can go to get uh, useful examples of statistics. And after he wrote it that was in 90s then a lot of people came on board so now you can find a smattering of real world example here and there and you can pick them up and you can use them to uh, to uh, make your lectures uh, relate with the reality. But it is a job, it is a task. Your normal textbook will not have any real world application. It will have a fake real world application. It will use real world data, but it will not deal with any real real world problem. So um, you have to integrate theory and practice. And one uh, other thing which is also a a uh, problem and a defect in Western methodology is that it deals only with the numbers, but the reality is hidden beneath the numbers. The data actually is providing us with a clue to the hidden reality, and so we have to reach through the data to get to the clue. Just like you know, the apple falls, so we can observe it, but the gravity is unseen. So the reason for the uh, apple falling is the gravity, which is unseen. Similarly. The data has a pattern. Now econometrics is all about saying, okay, find a pattern and extrapolate from it. This is wrong because not all patterns will replicate. The pattern will replicate only if there is a real force behind the data which creates this pattern. Then that real force will continue to operate. But most of the patterns that we study are accidental patterns. So they exist in this data, but tomorrow they won't exist. And so, uh, uh, this won't replicate and that's why most of the econometrics we do leads to wrong results because we build on patterns, we, we extrapolate from trends which are not real trends, which are just artificial accidental trends. And the same thing true is of true of uh, statistics. Statistics is actually to understand how statistics is used in the real world and this is again something which says, uh, so you have to understand that statistics is a way to persuade people with numbers. So it is actually a branch of, ret branch of rhetoric. How do we use numbers to persuade people of something or the other? What are the things that we're, we are trying to persuade people of? So there is a whole lecture on that. So uh, if we want to touch the hearts of the students, we have to appeal to their common background, which is that Allah Ta'ala himself introduced himself as a teacher of knowledge. Prophet was sent as a Mu'allim and the civilization of Islam was built on knowledge. The uh, Arabs were in the period of Jahiliyyah, ignorance and Islam did not give them knowledge. It gave them the thirst for knowledge. This is really very important. Islam did not teach them chemistry and physics but it, it made them into seekers of knowledge and that is all you need to do. If you can turn students into seekers of knowledge, they will find it. And there's no way you can compress all knowledge that they need into one course and feed it to them. So the only thing you can do is to make them interested in learning knowledge. So Islamic approaches provide a unique approach to knowledge, radically different from West. Western theories of, uh, emphasize observable, measurable, quantifiable, but the reality is unobservable, non-measurable, non-quantifiable. The West does not distinguish between useful and useless knowledge and Islam does. So one of my lectures is completely devoted to this uh, Islamic approach to knowledge. Now this runs into some trouble sometimes when you have a Christian student or a Hindu student in your class. So basically uh, uh, this has to be uh, explained that what we are doing actually is a teaching in opposition to the secular idea of knowledge that there is no purpose to life. So all religions are agreed and what we are teaching is actually a humanist per 
uh, approach which is based on the idea that our lives are meaningful we want to do useful things with this things and and on these the islamic teachings are aligned with the teachings of hinduism and with christianism but christianity but we just uh, focus on something which is uh, understood and familiar to the majority of the people in this culture but it is not meant to exclude so in fact initially i had labeled the course as introduction to statistics for muslim students but later uh, in light of this objection i changed the uh, to introduction to statistics and islamic approach so everybody can learn actually in spain uh, the madrasas uh, they had students uh, from all over europe and uh, christians and jews sat in those madrasas and they learned from the muslims so we teach the theory of islamic education and you will not find any objection to this theory from any christian or any hindu they have similar theories of education so some of the things that are important for this course is that uh, the west uh, says that there are some subjective things there are opinions these are useless and there are facts which are quantitative and numerical these are very useful facts are superior to opinions objective that data matters subjective does not that's why we are so concerned with numbers and that's why we don't we are not interested in interpretations because interpretation is subject subjective numbers are hard real the reality is the opposite of this uh the impact factors are trying to measure the quality but the quality itself is not measurable uh university rankings are also trying to measure quality of education that cannot be reduced to a number uh we want to measure the productivity of a scholar you can't do it by counting publications it is well uh so now what happens is because of the western obsession with numbers and quantification they try to take everything qual qualitative and reduce it to a number and this results in massive damage distortion loss of information loss of understanding and uh the pretense of knowledge this is the name that has been given that once you measure it and you have a number then you say okay now the ranking of pi is 9 and the uh, impact factor of this thing is 1.37 this number doesn't have the meaning that it is supposed to have it's trying to measure a quality and it cannot be measured so but, but the there is a, there is a deception which is done by this method which we are, we are trying to create awareness of and one of our lectures deals with this although i find that it's a very difficult i mean the concept is very easy but to convey this idea is very difficult because people are so mesmerized by number that the idea that some numbers are fake they are frauds and some numbers are real see the the real number is what traps students into believing the fake numbers so i say let's count the number of students there is only one number and it's accurate and correct and correctly defined but if i say measure the quality of education at wide or measure the level of corruption in pakistan there is no number which can do the job but the students are deceived in thinking just like we can accurately count the number of students so we can accurately measure the amount of corruption and this is wrong but this concept this misconception is very difficult to remove and then i wanted to discuss this that the specialization and fragmentation which has occurred that some people study very narrow areas of knowledge this is what allows people to take to exclude islam from knowledge by specializing it to such a narrow thing that it doesn't apply to our life so then you dis distinguish between theory and applied the statistician's task is only to study the numbers this is what we were taught in our and there is the field expert who takes these numbers and interprets them in the context of the field so there is this area called biostatistics so the biologist the doctor he looks at the drugs and what they do the statistician just looks at the numbers so now what i am saying is that this is impossible you cannot separate the application from the statistics if you have a collection of numbers which are test scores in exams or if they are the red blood cell counts or if they are the high income data different type of analysis will do, will be done with the exact same data set for these three things because so so the theory cannot be done in isolation of the reality and this is the main lesson that western statistical texts teach that you can do theory in isolation from reality 
so the consequence of this is that we as teachers have to supplement our knowledge as statisticians we are not uh, we are not in possession of knowledge because we only have the theory unless you know unless you go out and learn how to apply and this you will have to do because you were not taught in your courses how to do this so you'll have to go out and learn some part of this has been done for you in this course and others you can do for yourself and in fact as we develop this course we are trying to do this course in environmental science and in health and in public policy and we find that we can't do it because the examples were chosen for the economists and you have to change the real world example to the relevant field in order to make it come alive for that field you cannot uh, learning does not transfer across the real world just like i mean if we are doing bio statistics so we are studying statistics in the context of medicine this same statistics will be done differently if these are environmental examples or economic examples so you have to study each subject definitely each subject will have different types of real world examples so we teach mean median mode but if we want to ask which one of these is the right one it cannot be done with reference to the data set it has to be done with reference to the application so now i come to the mechanical aspects of the course so first of all the course is a complete online do it yourself course if somebody wants to do it and we have run this actually like this the students watch the lecture on your own then go through the lab on your own then uh, ah watch the lecture and do do the quiz then uh, watch the uh, then do the lab on your own there are instructions on how to do the lab and then do the quiz on the lab so we ran this course as an online course and nadia was one of the early students who completed this course and with an a grade she managed to do all the quizzes there was a, 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 a software we had now that was very primitive now we are actually we have a much uh, better system which allows grading and uh, we are working on an even much better system and we are hope to have it on, online by september and we are going to use this system to teach at uh, Uh, at uh, pied and we we can make it accessible hopefully if it comes online to anybody else so if you want your students but my uh, my recommendation and guess is that you should not you uh, give this student to your, uh, give this online course to your students to do uh it's up to you it's a, it's your choice uh, but my guess is that for the moment because students will be any yani, this is actually like two revolutions and the students will not be able to take it so uh, the better thing to do is for you to do the course online and then to get the students to do it so um uh provide feedback on the course to us and we will improve it uh so the way to do it is that this is a modular course each lecture is a separate module there is a video lecture on concepts and ideas So what you do is either watch the lecture or look at the slides or look at the transcript, and then um, you have the slides. Uh, use the slides to deliver your own lecture. And uh, remember that, any yani one way to do it is to not. Uh, any yani there are two ways. Either uh, uh, often you will find that the lecture is too long. Uh, this was the experience. So what you do is you split it up into half and do it in two steps. Or uh, I am not going to do it like that because I am going to. Uh, pressurize and force my students because they are in econometrics they have to study a lot more so i am going to do about half the concepts and i am going to say okay study the lecture on your own but you can make the lecture available video lecture available as a as a backup resource you don't insist that they have to watch it but you can say that if you are uh if you are having puzzles or confusion and you can the other way you can do is you can cover a few concepts in class uh in detail slowly so that they understand and then you can assign them the rest on homework so there are many ways and uh, actually it's a it's a dangerous thing to give choices because people get confused but uh the, the simplest way is to just divide the lecture in half and uh do two parts and then do the third part by do starting the lab helping them uh, do it and then uh, leaving them to finish on their own because you won't be able to finish in one class this is something that nadia and uzma have done for 
uh, three or four times and so they have a lot of experience. I don't know if you have had time to discuss this experience, but we can have it afterward. So um, uh, this is how you can do it um, because um, in your own lectures. We are working on automated grading of lab homeworks in Excel and hopefully we will have a system in place so that students can do it on their own. So you teach them and then the quiz they do at home. So that's one very useful thing because uh, what happens, even we had already this, that at the beginning of class you can see how many students did the quiz, what their performance were, which questions they got, which they didn't get, so you can see what they are understanding, what they are not. It's very helpful to the teacher. You can cover the material that they didn't understand and so on. Now in terms of mechanics, you should try to start the class exactly on time. It shows that you value the time of your students. You should understand that there's a huge amount of stuff to teach, all very precious knowledge, not, not uh, knowledge that is good for taking exams, but knowledge that is real value in applied in real world situations. <clears throat> I have had many students who have gone on to jobs, to academia, to other courses, and they have had lots of lots of feedbacks about how the material that was taught was of extremely uh, great value to them in firms and so uh, when you work on this you get the results but the problem is that it's not immediate I mean at the time that you're teaching the students will not appreciate it at all they will, all they will see is that they are being made to make work ma being made to work very hard and they are not getting any results <coughs> so you should be regretful that I only have an hour and a half you start on time and uh, end on time uh, one thing that I would like to do is, to, uh, because usually there are assignments, is to take a very short quiz at the beginning of class. Uh, and that can also be done by, uh, I mean mechanics, you flash the quiz, one or two questions on the screen. And you ask them to write it down, that way you don't have the, to waste time spreading papers. You ask them to write it down, then you ask them to swap them with each other, and then you grade it right away and you bring it back. So that way you can do the whole thing in 10 minutes. <coughs> Uh, get some feedback on learning at the end of class and there is one very easy mechanism, it's a one minute feedback. Take one minute to write down one point that you, uh, one best point that you understood in this class. So you, uh, as I've done when, when I've done this, you get a very large range of answers and from that you get a very nice picture of what happened in that class from just, uh, just this one minute feedback. There is a huge amount of overhead task associated with this. So fortunately that's why this on online course takes care of most of these. The quizzes they can take outside class, the labs they can do outside class and the <coughs> grading of labs can be done outside. It's all done, it's all set up. Although we hope that it will, it will be set up in a much better way uh, by September when we are currently actively it's being programmed. <coughs> but there are other ways to get around this which is to identify the bright, brighter students, create teams, have them teach each other, make them responsible for ensuring that the weakest person in, the, uh, in their group learns. Uh, we have done some um, things, create group activities, create competitions, use team leaders as, as your teaching assistants if you can't get an official teaching assistant. So a lot of the activity will be sort of self-graded. You make students your partners in learning. So this is very difficult. Students, yani it, 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 yani it requires a, a mind shift on part of students and on teachers that we are uh, partners in this process. Otherwise, if you tell the students self-grade, they will always give themselves a hundred and they will understand. So, so uh, it requires some work, but it can be done. I have done it successfully. All right, so that's all for the... Uh, lecture